Uh, my name is Jim Hopper. I'm the executive director of Bainbridge Community Foundation. Um, so if you are not local to Bainbridge Island, uh, Bainbridge Island is a little community about eight miles uh, off the coast of Seattle. And uh, we're about a 35 minute ferry ride from Seattle. Um, the community is is rich in cultural history um, from strawberry fields to boat, boat building and uh, many places, uh, many places and activities in between. The Community Foundation's uh, mission is to uh, enhance the quality of life of all uh, people who live on Bainbridge Island, who work on Bainbridge Island, and who visit Bainbridge Island. And so um, we have a, a broad mission to help um, serve serve uh, the community. Um, so you might ask, uh, those of you who are joining us from far afield, what is a little community foundation uh, in the Pacific Northwest doing to um, sponsor an event like this that has a national audience. And I will put it all squarely in the hands of Paul Merriman for something like that. He is um, an island resident. He has uh, served on the board of the Community Foundation and he has um, really brought his, his passion to the forefront. Um, all of you have community foundations that serve your community. They may serve your local community. They may serve your state community. Um, but we encourage you to um, get to know your community foundation and um, see what you can do to be a part of it. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Paul. Paul Merriman, um, as many of you know, is a nationally recognized um, expert and author on mutual funds, index investing, and asset allocation. Uh, most of you know him through his uh, regular column in uh, Market Watch, as well as his uh, podcasts and website and um, uh, social media posts and all sorts of things. So Paul is um, in, retired in 2012 after a long career in the industry and um, immediately took to figuring out how he can use all of the skills that he's gathered to um, teach people who don't typically have access to that education. Uh, about financial investments. And um, so it's within all of our benefit to learn from Paul. Um, I mentioned that he was on our board. He also uh, has his own foundation called the Merriman Financial Education Foundation, where he has um, sponsored a number of programs like this one um, to help get financial education in the hands of everybody. And um, one of his passions, and I encourage you to feel free to ask him about it, is um, his alma mater, Western Washington University, where Paul just recently created the Merriman Financial Literacy Program, which will ensure that every single student um, has uh, about 40 hours of financial education before they, they leave the college. So it's truly uh, the gift that keeps on giving. So with that, Paul, thank you so much for, for being here. And Christine, thank you for being here. And Paul's gonna go ahead and introduce Christine. Jim, thank you very much. It, uh... We've been out of town, my wife and I have, for some time, and it is great to see your smiling face. <laughs> we uh, miss be you. Back, be back soon. Very good. Uh, so th this is quite exciting to me tonight. Uh, I told somebody today that uh, I was going to be speaking tonight with Christine Benz, and uh, the person that he was with uh, then had to, you hear all about Christine Benz and what an amazing lady she is. This was not coming from me, by the way. This was coming from uh, from the person I was speaking with. And, and, and it was great to hear the wonderful things that people think about you, Christine. And it doesn't surprise me because uh, not only do you do uh, some important work at Morningstar, I've been there, I think, about 30 years uh, and uh, you are the director of personal finance and retirement planning. Uh, you do a, a, it's called the Long View, a great podcast where uh, you have, uh, actually, I think those things each about last about 45 minutes to an hour, terrific pieces, educational pieces to help investors. I understand you've got a new book. Uh, that's about to come out. I'm, I want to ask about that in just a second, but I don't want to miss the fact that Barron's has twice put you on the list of the 100 most, uh, I don't know if the word was powerful, fi financial people. Or, influential. Or influential. I liked it. That's good. Uh, and, and, uh, and of course, the, the, the list goes on. And, and uh, by the way, 
the fact that you are now the president of the John C. Bogle Financial Literacy Foundation, I think is the name. Am I close? Center for Financial Literacy. Very Center. close. Center. Oh, that is marvelous because uh, that organization uh, is working hard to spread the word at, at a very, uh, really, a, a, a low level where everybody can chime in and learn and share what they've learned. If you haven't been to the Bogleheads.com uh, uh, site, you ought to go check it out because you can ask a question there and you'll get 50, sometimes 100 people who will help you. And there's a big, there's a big uh, conference coming up in Minneapolis, September 27th to the 29th. I'm going to speak. I'm going to listen. And uh, and and I haven't seen the list of other folks who were coming to speak, but I know after having participated last year, what a group of folks you get out to, to participate. And uh, uh, John Bogle's got to be smiling somewhere, uh, the work that you are all are, are doing. So tonight, here you are. I know we, last time you were here, you worked off a of PowerPoint and you were had to work hard. I thought, could we make it a little easier for you and uh, take on some questions that uh, are on the minds of people? In fact, many of those, I'm going to guess, will be answered by your new book. The title is? The title is How to Retire, 20 Lessons for a Happy and Successful Retirement, I think is the subtitle. Terrific. Terrific. And uh, as I understand, when, when I when we spoke about half of it is about money mm -hmm. and half of it is about life. Right. They yeah. do go together. <laughs> <laughs> they do. Can't do one without the other. That's um, right. But it's funny, Paul, the more I have focused on this topic of retirement planning, the more I've realized, A, it's devilishly complicated. The, the whole business of accumulating assets for retirement is pretty straightforward relative to the process of, you know, spending from our portfolios. So it does delve into the financial aspect of, of a retirement plan and creating that plan that, you know, makes financial sense and also gives you peace of mind. But then it's also about all of the other things that we need to do to have a happy retirement. So like how to make sure that we're nurturing our relationships once we leave work. And this tends to be a bigger deal for men than women. Women tend to have social networks that extend beyond work. Um, for men, oftentimes it is their workplace that is providing them with a lot of social interaction. So I delve into that. I delve into the importance of having purpose and why, you know, I think, Paul, you're just such an amazing example of that, of, you know, though you're not working in a paid job anymore, you very much have something that gets you up in the morning that keeps you energized and gives you that sense of your, you know, that you're adding value to the world. Um, and so it, it, the book delves into a lot of those dimensions as well. Um, it's been a, a super fun project and a great learning experience because each chapter is essentially a lesson on how to do some aspect of retirement. And each chapter is an interview with a thought leader in that area about how to do that thing well. So it's, it's it's been a great project. And uh, I know that if our viewers want to help that book get at the top of the list, it comes out September 17th, correct? Exactly. And, and so if we all buy that book on September 17th, uh, you're going to come right to the top. People are going to notice it and and it's going to be a bigger success if more people notice it. And I might add, the thing that has helped with the books that, that I've done, and, and they don't reach nearly the audience that yours do, but boy, if you can read the book and then write a review at Amazon, uh, that is, that's, a, that's a powerful thing uh, to, for uh, an author to have folks say nice things, honest things, we hope, uh, about the book. So stay tuned and put down September 17th and uh, thanks for that, Paul. I appreciate yeah. it. I, as I read through it, you know, I'm always really critical of things that I work on. As I read through it, there, there have been a few nights where I've been so excited about the 
the wisdom that I think is in the book, and this is coming from the people I've interviewed, not not for me, but I just it's I I hope that it's helpful. I hope that it's useful. It's been inspiring to me to to work on it, and, and I hope people find it. Useful. Great. Well, good luck. But tonight I want to talk about the three D's. Uh, I didn't tell you that I wanted to talk about the three D's, but here they go. Diversification, distributions, defense. And I think those three things, if we understand them and we know how to work with them, uh, are huge life changers in terms of potential return. So with your permission, could we start with diversification. When I came into the industry in 1960, mid-60s, diversification was 10 to 20 stocks in a portfolio. That was considered to be enough diversification. Things have changed. What is today the idea of a good diversification that you've managed risk and you've exposed yourself to something for a return? What is diversification? Yeah, well, it's a good question. I think you get the biggest bang for your buck from a diversification standpoint by diversifying across asset classes um, and then maybe even backing up, to, you know, before we get to the portfolio, you know, if you're thinking about retirement, you're thinking about all of your cash flow streams. So not just your portfolio cash flow, but also other sources of cash flow that you might be able to turn on. So for most of us, Social Security will be a source of cash flow in retirement. For some of us, a dwindling share of us, but some of us, some people will have pensions um, that they'll be bringing into retirement. People might have idiosyncratic sources of income like rental properties that they own that provide them you know, with a stream of income on an ongoing basis. So the idea, I think, is to try to diversify there. The more of those cash flow streams that you can bring into retirement, that will tend to be beneficial. It will, it will buffer you against um, relying exclusively on your investment portfolio. So, you know, I'd start there, think, thinking about diversifying those cash flow streams and maximizing them. Maximizing Social Security is... Uh, I would say one of the first jobs of retirement planning where you're coming up with a plan for when you will begin taking benefits. If you're part of a married couple, couple, it's helpful to add a little bit of strategy there. And here I would reference Mike Piper's great tool called Open Social Security, which is a free tool that you can use where you plug in a little bit of detail about your earnings history, your spouse's earnings history, and it will pr provide you with an estimate of a, sort of the optimal claiming strategy based on what you've told it. Um, so you can add details about your health history. If you think you're in better than average health, for example, um, if you're worried about, if say you're a younger person, you're worried about potential changes to the social security program uh, before you begin receiving benefits, you can reduce your benefits give them, say, like a 20% haircut to account for potential changes in the program and on down the line. So start there. And then, you know, as you're thinking about your portfolio, thinking about the asset class exposures of those portfolios, of that portfolio, that's the best way to diversify the portfolio itself. Just make sure that you have a sensible mix of assets ranging from very safe cash type assets to more aggressive assets with more growth potential, but also more volatility potential attached to them. So that's your globally diversified equity portfolio. And then in between, you'd probably want some high quality fixed income assets, but those would be the big three that I'd be thinking about with respect to my um, investment portfolio. And then within each of those three sleeves, but especially the fixed income sleeve and the equity sleeve, I would really go to town in terms of diversifying those exposures. And the nice thing is, is that, you know, I'm a boglehead. I'm someone who's a believer in the virtue of low cost indexing. You can buy a very well diversified basket of stock investments, bond investments with a very low price tag today. Just buy a total market index fund, a total 
total bond market index fund. You might add, say, a short-term bond fund and maybe a little bit of treasury inflation protected security exposure, but you don't need to get too complicated in terms of diversifying the portfolio. Um, so I'll just stop right there. I know you, I'm sure you have good follow-up questions, Paul. Um, you know, I, I, know I, I want to respond to some things you said. You mentioned cash in the investment portfolio. Now, do you really think that cash should be something in a long-term portfolio. I understand the need, short-term needs, but uh, would you have some cash? And if so, why? Yeah. So it does depend on the investor's life stage. For a younger investor, a person who's still accumulating assets for retirement, I would um, you know, just keep that emergency fund on the side. And I would elevate the size of that emergency fund as I age. Um, because people who are older tend to have more specialized jobs. They tend to have higher salaries. Those jobs can be a little bit harder to replace if you lose them for whatever reason. So I would start building a cash buffer that's more like a year's worth of, of living expenses as I move into my 50s and beyond. Then in retirement, I do think it makes sense to hold a larger cash cushion as an ongoing uh, part of the portfolio. And there I would think of um, maybe one to two years worth of portfolio cash flows of portfolio cash flows that you would hold aside. Um, and the reason that I would do so is to protect you in a year like 2022, where we had both stocks and bonds falling at the same time. Granted, that doesn't happen much, but it has happened. And so mm -hmm. the idea is that you do not want to be draw withdrawing from your assets when they're depressed, you want to um, have something that you can rely on to supply your cash flows in a year like that. So that is why I would hold some cash reserves on an ongoing basis, just to protect you in that worst case scenario, to give you something to spend from in, in that bad market scenario. You know, the first thing that came out of your mouth when you were talking about diversification, you said that the most bang for your buck was to spread your money across a number of different asset classes. Now, I've got to tell you, I started interviewing John Bogle, Tom Cock and I did on our radio show a, a decades ago. And his answer was basically, put your money in the S&P 500. Then a little later, he said it was okay to add a little bit of small and it was okay to add a little bit of international but you felt like he was going in there kicking and screaming and but it is interesting how the how the industry has changed there are still a lot of people who really believe all you need for equities is the total market index because that gives you exposure to a whole bunch of of of, of different based on cap weighting exposure. Now, I think it would be worth a second if you could address the implications of a cap-weighted fund uh, in terms of what an individual actually ends up owning in a total market index or, or an S&P 500. Yeah. So the total market index is just, just how it sounds. It aims to hold a representative basket of all of the companies available in the U.S. If you hold a total global market, it'll attempt to do that globally. Um, S&P 500 is a narrower basket of companies. It excludes the smaller companies. I think um, you know most investors should probably think about kind of a total market portfolio. I really love the idea of a total global market portfolio where you're holding some of the smaller companies as well as the larger ones. You do see a little bit more volatility in a total market index versus say an S&P 500 index. There might be small discrepancies in terms of long-term returns over time. And Paul, you would probably know with more precision than I do, but they tend to be pretty close um, over time. Maybe uh, S&P 500 has recently looked a little better because small caps haven't been performing especially well, but they tend to be pretty close. You get a little bit more volatility with the total market index, but you also get some, some more diversification and you'll have periods when those smaller stocks will really shine. 
Um, so I like the idea of taking a, a broader brush to these market exposures. Well, and of course, these these uh, cap weighted portfolios mean that most of the money you make is going to be driven by the top 50 to 100 companies. And in the total market index, there's 3,700 companies, which means that basically the big hundred are still pushing, carrying most of the load for that for that return. So it it, it is fairly, it, it it's fairly focused in, in terms of what it does. And what you're talking about is diversifying beyond that. And by the way, I do, I, I noted uh, in, in, on your site, uh, there's a great, in fact, we'll have a link to a couple of your reports, one on diversification, one on distributions. They are terrific pieces. I think you come out with them annually, if I'm not mistaken. Right. And there's one on target date funds. Again, terrific stuff. But here's what I really thought was, was cool. Your folks have predicted that for the next 30 years, and obviously, they don't know. They're not pretending they know, but they they have their ways of predicting anyway. That the large growth asset class, and that's not the S and P five hundred. That's kind of half of the S and P five hundred, is going to grow at eight point six. Large value eight point eight. Small growth ten point three. Small value twelve point nine. Now, of course, you know I'm going to fan of small cap value but it does find it inter it's interesting to me that when i look then at morningstar's recommended portfolio they have 10 percent in small cap value and 30 percent in large cap growth and 30 percent in large cap value what do you think the thinking is in building a portfolio that for what they think is going to be the best performing asset class that they put the least in it. Well, so I should say, Paul, that that um, those specific uh, return assumptions that you that you just cited um, are mainly that we create the portfolio to be kind of a base case in some simulations that we do about safe spending rates for, for retirement. So um, it's not necessarily that we think that that is the best structure for a portfolio. It's just the one that we use as the baseline for our, our modeling of um, sort of safe withdrawal rates. Mm -hmm. So um, it's it's not necessarily that we have a lot of conviction in that specific asset allocation, if that makes sense. So these would be different asset allocations than your portfolios because you do publish how you think people should build a portfolio. And a lot of people follow that. Uh, and and how what what is the the, the theory or your thinking behind your, your own portfolios? Sure. So I have a series of model portfolios on the website um, and they're there really just for educational purposes. We're not selling anything related to them, mm -hmm. um, but they're made, they're meant to illustrate sound investment concepts, sound asset allocation principles. So the accumulator portfolios or the saver portfolios are geared toward people who are saving for retirement and they are majority equity for people who are younger investors, people who are in their 20s and 30s. And then the um, fixed income allocation scales up very gradually as people get into their 40s and 50s, similar to a target date glide path. Mm -hmm. um, there is a slight emphasis on uh, small cap value in the portfolios for younger investors. Um, also a, a pretty fully globalized portfolio. So kind of in line with the US, non-US uh, market cap division for younger investors. And then the non-US piece scales down a little bit as people get closer to retirement with the, the idea there is just sort of uh, with a non-US stock portfolio, you're getting some foreign currency risk. And our thinking is that as people get close to retirement, as they get close to actually spending from that portfolio, that you'd want to try to reduce risk exposures like that a little bit. So you should have some foreign stocks as a component of your portfolio as you embark on retirement, but probably not as much as you as you should have when you're a younger investor. So 
when people are in the accumulation phase, it's a fairly standard glide glide path, we call it, that gets more conservative and bond heavy as retirement approaches. When retirement approaches, I think people should take a step back. And I think I've talked about this at this event in the past. I like the idea of using this bucket type strategy where you're thinking about, okay, what are my, what kind of demands am I placing on this portfolio each year? And I would use that as kind of the measuring stick to determine how much to drop into each asset classes, each of the asset classes. So say I'm using uh, the 4% guideline in terms of my retirement spending. Well, I'd want to think about having, I mentioned earlier, maybe one to two years worth of cash in um, the, the uh, liquid reserve. So I would have, say, 8% of my portfolio. If I'm using a 4% spending rate, I'm thinking about having two times that. So that would be 8% in cash. And then maybe another five to eight years worth of portfolio withdrawals in a high quality fixed income portfolio that's diversified across short and intermediate term bonds, um, maybe hold some inflation protected bond exposure. So again, if I'm using that 4% spending rate and I'm thinking about eight years worth of cash flows in fixed income, that's another 32% of my portfolio if people are following. So I've got my 4% withdrawal times eight years. That's 32%. With those two buckets that I've just talked about, I've got effectively 10 years worth of portfolio withdrawals. So Armageddon could happen to the stock market. The stock market could go down and stay down for a good long time. And I'd still be okay. I'd not have to touch any of that stuff when it's yeah. down in the dumps. That's the basic thinking here. And, and you know, to inform how much to drop into those first two buckets, well, we use the probability of having a positive return over that specific spending horizon. So for my very short-term spending horizon, well, yes, bonds are safe, but they're not guaranteed safe. So I'd want to hold cash. If I have a slightly longer time horizon, when we look at the probability of having a positive return over say that three to five year horizon, well, bonds have historically been a pretty good bet if that's your rough time horizon. So that's kind of the thinking in that, uh, you know, how you would structure your, your bucket type portfolio. And I just think it's an intuitive way to think about asset allocation for drawdown mode, especially for people who are getting close to or in retirement. Um, and the nice thing is, is that it's really customizable. So for the person who is, um, say, the pensioner, the, the college professor, for example, who's lucky enough to have that full pension that's coming online in retirement. Well, the nice thing is, you know, you're kind of building that portfolio for your heirs, for your charities, whatever the case might be. You'd probably want a more aggressively positioned portfolio. But if you're, you know, using a more traditional spend, spend down from the portfolio, you'd want to have more cash and bonds set aside. So I like that you can really structure the portfolio based on whatever cash flow demands that you expect to place on that portfolio. That's terrific. That's terrific. And, and along with that, you've recently uh, come out with some, some new ideas or, or or new numbers for the safe withdrawal rate. And before you talk about those new numbers, I'm not sure that everybody understands what a safe withdrawal rate is. Would you give us a, a 101 on safe withdrawal rates and then bring us up to date on your thinking about how much we can take out? Yeah, thanks, Paul, for that question. There's so much confusion about this Um and I would argue that this is the hardest problem in all of financial planning, helping people figure out how much they can safely withdraw in retirement. And the reason it's so hard is because you're planning around all these unknowables. So we don't know how the markets will behave, uh, stocks or bonds or interest rates or anything like that. We don't know how long we'll live. And yep. we don't even know like when we'll retire necessarily. I've seen data that point to the fact that people are really poor at actually predicting when they'll retire, that there tends to be a mismatch where people tend to think they'll be able to work longer 
than they will uh, or than, than they actually do. And there are a lot of reasons that people do uh, hang it up earlier than they expected. Some, you know, good, maybe their portfolios performed better than they expected. But, you know, we know ageism is a thing in our culture. We know that um, some people have jobs that are physically demanding that they just can't do. People might have health issues or their spouse has health issues. Lots of reasons that people need to retire earlier than they expected. So you're planning around all these difficult variables. But the basic idea is if you're retiring with this portfolio, it seems like a lot of money, but how much can you reasonably withdraw from it on a year to year basis? And people tend to be pretty poor judges of this unless they're really steeped in this, in which case they've probably been following the research. But Fidelity did some research on this uh, five or so years ago where they asked people to just sort of guesstimate how much they could reasonably take out. And some of the uh, estimates, frankly, were a little bit worrisome. So pe I think they, you know, you had a lot of people saying that they thought they could take 10% yeah. out of their portfolio. Well, if you're planning for like a 30 year horizon, 10% is probably maybe if you hit it exactly right and your investments perform exactly right, you'll be fine. But for, for most people, 10% is a risky amount to take out. So people need help with this. But the basic idea is trying to help people figure out, well, how much can you safely take from that portfolio, adding to your social security and other income? What's a reasonable amount to take out given how we think that the, that the market might behave? So that's the basic question that we're trying to answer with this research. Um, it's something, Paul, as you mentioned, that we've been working on since 2021, I think was when we initially did the research. Um, and we're attempting to be forward looking. People may have heard about the 4% guideline for retirement spending. This was a, a guideline developed by William Bengen. Bangin is still con conducting research on this topic. I think he's been a really thoughtful voice in this area. But in his research, he used backward looking returns. So looked back over market history with an eye towards saying, okay, if you happen to retire in the worst case scenario in the worst possible market environment, what was the most that you could have taken over that subsequent 30 year horizon? So Bangin, uh, hit on this 4% guideline. Our research is a little different in that we do plug in a forward-looking forecast of 30-year of market returns over the next 30 years. So that's a little bit of a variation in our research versus Bengen's research. The idea with our research is that starting conditions matter quite a lot, like what the state of yields are today. Thankfully, they're a little bit better. We're making some assumptions about what we think inflation will do over the next 30 years. And we're also looking at where the equity markets are. U.S. equities are a little bit expensive uh, to our team. And so we think that uh, investors who are embarking on retirement today should be a little bit conservative in terms of what they expect from stock returns. So let me make sure I understand this safe withdrawal rate. It, the 4% suggests that and that also is, a, is a going to accommodate inflation as over time, that the money will last for 30 years, right? Yes, exactly. Doesn't that's, mean you have that's anything left over. I mean, it's a different plan if you're trying to leave money to people, your kids and charities and whatnot. Right. And, and, and so that complicates things a little bit because most of us don't like to think about running out of, even coming close to running out of money. Right. And the good news is, is that um, in most market environments, if you use, say, a 4% uh, spending rate as your, as your starting spending rate, and I should say, here we're not suggesting if we say 4%, and that was the conclusion from our 2023 research, we're not saying that you are spending 4% of that portfolio in perpetuity th for, throughout your retirement. What we're saying is that you take 4% of that balance at the beginning of your retirement. So just to make it simple, um, to $40,000 of a million dollar portfolio would be your your 4% withdrawal in year one. And then you're giving yourself a raise of that dollar amount 
each year thereafter in retirement. So in year two, it's like you say it's 3% inflation, we're at $41,200 in year two and on down the line because people do need inflation adjustments, but that that's sort of the base case that we use in our research. In reality, people don't actually spend that way. They tend to spend a little bit less throughout retirement because um, uh, you just sort of lifestyle choices that people tend to not fully take a full inflation increase as the years go by, but that's the base case kind of straw man case that we use in our research. And the, the point I wanted to make about that is that in the vast majority of market environments, that'll be too conservative, that people will end up with leftovers at the end of their lives that they in turn can pass to their heirs or, or charity or, or whatever their choices might be. So um, the idea is that most people would rather not run out, not come close to run to running out. So we um, tend, would tend to skew a little bit more conservative with with the spending rate guidance. So talk a little bit about, uh, along with this revamping the 4% to 4.5 or whatever, the amount of equity you have in the portfolio. I was fascinated by your study on the difference between 20%, 40%, 60%. It's a big deal. And share that information generally, if you would. Sure. So it's a little bit counterintuitive, but each year as we approach this research, we do look at how different asset allocations would behave. And you might think, well, automatically, if I hold more equity, I should be able to take more from my portfolio, right? If I'm taking more risk, I should be able to assume a higher return. Um, and the answer is, Yes, sort of, but you're also adding volatility to that portfolio and you're also subjecting your plan to what retirement researchers call sequence of return risk. And that basically means if you have big losses early on in retirement, which is something that you run the risk of having if you have a too aggressively positioned portfolio, that can deal your portfolio blow from which it can never recover because you're spending from a dwindling portfolio that leaves less of the less of the portfolio in place to repound, rebound and recover when the markets eventually do. So that's the reason why you don't necessarily want to dial your asset allocation up to 100 um, when you embark on retirement. You want to have that safer stuff to draw upon. In our 2023 research, we came out with, I think, sort of a perplexing conclusion, which is that more conservative asset allocations actually delivered a higher starting safe withdrawal percentage. So that 4% that I talked about, that actually corresponded with quite a light equity weighting. So just a 20 to 40% allocation to stocks, the rest in fixed income assets actually gave you that higher withdrawal rate over a 30 year time horizon. If you dialed the equity allocation up somewhat counterintuitively, your safe withdrawal rate went down a little bit. And that's largely a function of the very conservative spending system that we're asking our Monte Carlo simulations to use. So I mentioned that we're, we're basically asking for kind of a paycheck equivalent throughout retirement. So my 40,000 with my annual inflation adjustment, I'm basically saying, I'm gonna put blinders on about what's happening with the portfolio. Just give me that paycheck and I'll keep taking it out. I don't care what's going on. Most people are willing to kind of plug into what's going on with their portfolio value, with their portfolio balance from year to year. If you are, if you're willing to be a little bit flexible in those withdrawals, you can you can hold more equities. You can probably take more over, you know, as a starting withdrawal and over your life cycle. If you're okay with that possibility of having to change up your withdrawals based on what's what's happened with your portfolio. So if after a bad year like 2022 and almost nothing but cash did well in your portfolio, well, you have to take a little less after that portfolio after that portfolio loss, which can be tough medicine, especially given what we saw go on with inflation recently, you know, saying saying someone, not only do you not get your inflation increase, but maybe ideally you would take a little less. Not everyone's good with that. 
um, especially with pe for people with tighter plans where more of their spending is going toward sort of basic living expenses, they may be a little less okay with those sorts of trade-offs. On the other hand, people with plans with a little more wiggle room where if I'm saying, well, yeah, maybe don't take that vacation or don't take two vacations this year, just take one. Um, but next year, maybe you'll be able to take two or even three. People with more wiggle room in their plans are probably okay with that flexibility in their in their spending. In the paper, we do model out a lot of different spending strategies, a lot of these variable spending strategies. That's really where the action is in terms of retirement spending research. Many people have had a go at this topic, including us. And the conclusion is if you can be flexible with your spending, try to do it because that redounds to the benefit of your lifetime spending from, from that portfolio. And by the way, I should also say this ties in with some of the non-portfolio income sources that we were talking about earlier. If you can maximize the, the non-portfolio income, then I think you can be more comfortable with these variable strategies. If you can kind of match the non-portfolio income sources with your fixed spending, with your, you know, your housing and your food costs and your insurance costs, your healthcare costs. If you can try to line those things up, then essentially your portfolio is kind of providing you your discretionary spending and you're, you, you should be able to be more flexible there. So I think those things go hand in hand. And, and when I said that the three topics I wanted to talk about were defense, diversification, and distributions, I think one of the biggest defensive steps that you can take is to oversave. I mean, uh, who wants to oversave? I want to oversave because if I oversave, there's room for mistakes in terms of what the market does to me or for me. And uh, if you look at the studies of even an extra 25%, certainly if you're 50% oversaved from what you absolutely need, that is a big, big decision to make. And I want you to help some folks that have, we have a lot of questions tonight. I've gotten them already, many of them, but, but a lot of them had to do with looking into a plan like you're talking about, Christine, that going to retire, but they have got all this money that now has got to be in a certain amount of equity and a certain amount of fixed income. And the thing that so many people are afraid of from the time, from the first day they, they invest, they're afraid of, they're going to put the money in the market and it's going to go down. Some people live with that fear their whole life as an investor. So what would you tell people who have ended up for one reason or another, with mostly cash that they're going to have now they've got to put to work for retirement to deal with the fact that right now, if I look at the at the PE ratio of the large growth index, it's 31 times earnings. That's a, historically a high number. Uh, by the way, for people who don't know it, the large cap value index is 16 times earnings. I mean, the, 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 these are two very different markets and a lot of people don't realize how different they are. But I, I think what we're concerned about is this, this 31 times earnings. So you've already given us a hint, I think, that you don't have to be 60 or 70 or 80% in equities in order to be able to underwrite your your retirement. But what are the steps that people should take to protect them? What's the defense that we could apply here that would let people do it and sleep well? Yeah, a really good question, um, Paul. And I think the key is to have some sort of asset allocation target that you're working towards. So use that as the starting point, like what's reasonable based on my proximity to spending. So I shared a couple of, you know, sort of quick and dirty ways to think about setting an asset allocation target. One, if you're an accumulator, look to a target date fund or look to maybe two or three target date funds and see, well, what are they, you know, what are they recommending for 
mm-hmm. people who are approximately in my age band, you know, at my expected retirement date. I think you'll find kind of a comforting convergence there. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you are someone who is closer to retirement, you could use something like that bucket strategy that I talked about, but just make sure that you have some sort of asset allocation target that you're working toward. And then if your portfolio is too conservative relative to that target, I would say, you know, you you'd want to think about using whatever chicken avenues you can take to get you to that target. So I'd think about dollar cost averaging in. So like spacing out my purchases, maybe putting my um, purchases on a sort of monthly program where I'm just doing that buy of equities, uh, regardless of what's going on in the market and you won't catch it perfectly. You know, you won't absolutely time the bottom, but nor will you, uh, you know, hit the absolute top. So I would take advantage of dollar cost averaging to get the money in, you know, in line with the target. And I'd also diversify the asset class exposure. So I think one of the best things that U.S. investors can think about with respect to their portfolios today is to just make sure they have that non-U.S. exposure. We've had this period where non-U.S. has really underperformed U.S. stocks in part because of those magnificent seven companies, some of which I know are based in the Pacific Northwest, um, just the companies that have performed... <laughs> Some people have done really well with them, but um, I would make sure that I had non-U.S. exposure in the portfolio. I see that as kind of a backdoor way to diversify some of the risk factors that I think are looming large for the U.S. market. You'd want to think about having small caps and value because, as you said, Paul, the, the U.S. market is very dominated by a pretty narrow group of companies today. So you just want to make sure they have other market exposures in the portfolio. So I would just take risk off the table every step of the way in terms of my timing, in terms of the complexion of the investment portfolio. Um, And then, you know, just try to tune out the day-to-day market gyrations, Um, you know, turn off CNBC, turn off the alerts on your phone that are, you know, talking about what's going on with the market and um, just just stick with your plan. Also, I, I should say I'm a big believer in people having what's called an investment policy statement where they have documented, okay, here's my target asset class exposure. Here's how often I plan to check up on this portfolio. And I happen to think a good once annual checkup is plenty for most investors, but you're just kind of committing yourself to, here's what I'm doing. And that has, I think, a side benefit that your loved ones could, if something happens to you, they could pick it up and see, okay, here's the sort of rough plan that we are adhering to to here in case they need to manage this for you for whatever reason. So let me see if I could put some numbers uh, into what you just suggested. Are you saying that Somebody has an amount of money that two years from now, they would like to be 50-50 stocks and bonds. And uh, that during that two-year period, uh, they are going to need something to live on. Uh, And so they would then put that money aside to live on in cash, money market funds, paying 4 or 5%. Uh, and then would they dollar cost average in over two years, maybe? I mean, we need a period of time that would be reasonable. So by the time that they've done this for two years, they've got their cash to live on. They should probably take their bo- other the rest that you're going to have in bonds. Go ahead and put that to work. You wouldn't have to dollar cost that. But you could dollar cost average the other part to where you end up being 40, 50, 60% in equities. Is that a is that a reasonable process? It is. I think that's a sensible way to approach it and the value is that you're minimizing regret, you know, as I said, you're yeah. minimizing the chance that that you'll have put the money to work at exactly the wrong time. On the other hand, I do think time horizon is in the mix too. So, um I don't imagine that we have many younger investors listening into this retirement conversation, but in case we do, you know, if you if 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 it's a younger investor, we know that over very long periods of time the market generally goes up. I would say just get that money in 
as soon as, uh, you know, as is practical, yes. just, just get it working for you. But on the other hand, as you're, you know, if you're someone who's in retirement or close to retirement, you do need to protect yourself. And so I think I would be a little bit more deliberate. I, I think a two-year time horizon sounds perfectly reasonable. Yeah. In the past, when I, when I was an advisor, from time to time, I'd run into a 40-year-old, 45-year-old kind of an investor uh, that was really worried about taking the risk in the market. And they'd done well. They had accumulated a lot of money. And uh, I would often recommend that if they feel that way, they could be 60, 40. If they they wouldn't they would get where they were trying to go, but I encouraged them with the money they were putting in, new money they were putting in, pretend that you were a first time investor and be dollar cost averaging into the market with the new money while you've got that big base going forward more slowly, more than likely, but at least take the pressure off people worry because it's it's it, 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 we we all know the ad that the the quotes from John Bogle, emotions and expenses, those are our two biggest enemies. And um, and can we talk about expenses for a minute? You've already brought up the idea that we should be investing in low cost index funds. I think it's, do you think it's an advantage? Index funds are an advantage in every way over actively managed. I know I went back and saw some of your work in 2019. This slide, I just wanted to, kind of see what the evolution of your work has been. And there was a time when you wrote about actively managed funds a lot. Still do. And yes, that's true. And But it does beg the question, do we or do we not believe that active management can outperform passive? Yeah, so um, we have so much research on what tends to predict good or bad performance among mutual funds. And um, our passives research team, the team that covers index funds and ETFs, puts out this passive, I think active passive barometer is what they call it. And the basic idea is that it's a temperature check on how have active managers done relative to passively managed funds. And the scorecard is not great for active management when we look at this. It does depend a little bit by category, um, and it does change a little bit based on time period. So you have categories where the data about being passive are pretty clear. So large cap U.S. stocks, for example, the active managers have not distinguished themselves especially well. Fixed income, it depends on the time period, but that's been a little bit of a fairer fight where bond managers have been um, able to do a little better than the index over some periods of time. But the big differentiator is fees. So if it's an active fund that has average or above average fees, well, that's a poor bet. If you're looking at the subset of active funds, say Vanguard's actively managed funds, which I hold in my own portfolio, well, there you're starting to look at a fairer fight, that, that cheap active fund versus mm -hmm. the index fund. Um, I happen to believe that it's not that active managers are stupid. It's just that many of them are hobbled by very high costs that it make that yeah. make it difficult for them to outperform. So um I'm not completely averse to people considering active funds, but do yourself a favor and focus on that. If, if you like some active funds, focus on that subset of inexpensive active funds. And then I would also say, you know, there are some categories where our team just doesn't think it's a great bet to be passive. So these tend to be kind of niche categories like high yield bonds, for example, or junk mm. bonds. To the extent that you want that exposure in, in your portfolio, our team thinks that a fund like Vanguard High Yield, I think it's called Vanguard High Yield Corporate, an active fund, is actually better than buying a basket of, you know, sort of low quality, highly indebted um <laughs> borrowers. So um, we would we would we would think that in a few categories you're better off using some sort of an active product. But just just keep it cheap, which whatever you do. I don't know if you have a secret, a secret thing that Morningstar has on their on their website where they analyze mutual funds 
The thing that I find that most people don't know about is that price link where you can go into a mutual fund and see the tax efficiency of a fund. And one of the things that oftentimes those actively managed funds, uh, they may have a 1% a year or 1.5% a year loss in taxes because of their turnover versus the, the, the index fund is a third of 1%. That's a huge difference. Now, that's my favorite hidden place on more. Do you have a hidden place that people don't know about that they should go and look and they would understand uh, investing any better? I'm just curious whether you well, have. Well, that's a, that's a good one. And I would say, Paul, that is such an important point for people who have taxable holdings. So um, that tax cost ratio on the site does essentially show you like an expense ratio how much you're giving up to tax costs if you invest with that fund. And as you mentioned, um, sometimes they can run really quite high. So you're effectively, so say the fund has a 1% expense ratio, you've got this tax cost ratio that's 1% and your return is 10%. Well, you just gave up 20% of your return with those two line items. Yep. So um, take, take a look at that. If you're investing in the confines of a tax sheltered account, that tax cost ratio won't matter to you. You're not, you're not paying it as long as you're inside of an IRA or a 401k or something like that. But it's a really nice data point. Um, in terms of uh, parts of the site that I like, one, one piece that I often refer to is we have this markets fair value graph that mm. looks at the price to fair values for all of the companies that our equity analysts cover. So we have a fairly sizable team of, um, I think, 100 plus researchers on individual companies. And they we task them with coming up with a fair value for the companies that they cover. So, um, you know, if they think that a company should be worth $100 and its current price is $80, the price to fair value is 0.8 for that company. Um, or if it's worth a hundred or if it's currently selling for $120, but again, the analyst thinks it's worth a hundred dollars, the price to fair value would be 1.2. The fair value graph takes all of those companies together, all of those price to fair values and bundles them. And I think it's a good way to get a sense of like, well, is the overall market expensive or cheap? right now. So I just, you know, I'm not suggesting anyone do market timing, but I just like to take a look at it just to get a temperature check. Like, okay, it feels like things have gone up and up and up. Should I be worried? Well, right now, you know, for example, I think we're trading right in line with fair value, maybe slightly oh. overvalued because earnings growth has been pretty good. So companies actual fundamentals have come up, even though prices have escalated, fundamentals have come up. So um, that's one sort of, I think, cool part of the site. And I think I'm pretty sure that it's a free part of the website. So it's not like you need to be a subscriber. That's, that's great. I'm also curious, do you go to individual funds and use the chart function and then compare mutual funds from when they started? I mean, I can go back and look at dimensional funds, small cap value that started in 1993, put its chart up, and I can it'll, it'll allow me to go in there and put in the S&P 500 from Vanguard and bingo. We can see how those two funds have done since 1993. And the fascinating part for us in terms, I think, in, in learning from that is it's amazing how often you'll have this advantage for one, and all of a sudden... It comes down and then you'll see that they go back and forth. Now, at the end of the day, the small cap value did better, but it went through a lot of periods when you would have been, I mean, you can see that what you're going to possibly have to live through uh, as an investor. Yeah, I, I love that. And I love that you can plug in like different time periods um, to take a closer look at how performance would, would have sh shaken out during specific market environments. So your own personal uh, asset allocation, uh, do, do, you, do you eat your own cooking? Do you yourself invest the way that 
uh, or have have you found more comfort in in a strategy that that is very different than what others might find comfortable? Yeah, no, I would say very much. Um, I I invest in the way that I would tell others to invest. Um, so my personal portfolio, I I will say um, in Warning Stars four hundred one k, we have access to some funds that I like that I. And I, I will also say I headed up our Morningstar Fund research group for a while. So I'm kind of a, I feel like I'm a better than average fund owner in that I, you know, actually know some of these managers. Um, so I have Oakmark Select in my Morningstar 401k plan, um, a few Vanguard funds, Vanguard International Growth is in the 401k and I've owned it, I think, since I joined the company. So there are some active funds in my portfolio. Um, Oakmark would be toward the more expensive side of, of things, um, certainly more than I would wish to pay, but that's what it charges and it's been a good performer. Um, but I think of myself as a pretty good fund owner and I do own some active funds there, some passives as well in mm -hmm. our personal. And I would say my husband is majority passive in his um uh, his 401k. And then in our personal portfolio, we've made an effort to be super minimalist there. So we hold um, a couple of Vanguard funds, um, Vanguard International Growth, Vanguard Prime Cap Core uh, for our equity exposure, Vanguard Developed Markets Index, which is an index fund, um, and some municipal bond funds run by Vanguard, and then Vanguard's municipal money market. So that's in our taxable account um, in our Roth IRAs, we own Vanguard International Value. But we have really tried to reduce the number of moving parts in our portfolio. And I just saw the value um, as I was working on getting our tax stuff ready for our accountant. It just really reduced the number of things that we had to send his way because we we try to have just, you know, our 401k providers, our taxable account provider. We've tried to reduce the number of providers and then within them, the number of, of holdings within those um, within those accounts. Well, um, you're, you're such a nice person. You're so good to help so many people that I just can't help but say that I, I hope you have invested in Morningstar stock. Well, that's my, that's the thing that I've <laughs> done badly. I mean, I've done well, but I have had a hard time. We actually work with a financial planner and that's her main comment to us. is just like, we got to get rid of this stock because, um, and we've been trying, but, and we've been trying to do it tax efficiently, but it, um, it's been a phenomenal performer and, uh, yeah. yeah, it's been a really high class problem to have that we have, uh, more morning star stock than would be ideal. Certainly more than I would tell anyone else to have of their employer stock. It's not a great idea to you know be simultaneously getting your paycheck from the company where you have a lot of your um, a lot of your portfolio staked. Well, I'm happy for your success. And I think, Jim, I think it's about time that we take some questions. I, I don't know if Jim is with us right now. So I'm yes, I am. And can can you go ahead and shoot a couple to Christine since you you're on the on the mark there? Yeah, that's great. Um, so just to um, start with, Christine, is is pre-ordering your book a possibility? I think it is, uh, Jim. Thank you for that question. And thanks for the nice soft pitch there, Paul, earlier. Um, <laughs> I do believe people can pre-order the book. It's called How to Retire. The publisher, publisher is Harriman House. That's great. That's great. Um, let me look. I'll, I'll it, go ahead, is, isn't morning's uh whoops morning side it said this morning star uh projections over long term equal to average projected return it wouldn't include risk in short term so having uh a 10 in value might be uh appropriate uh, you know uh, those those returns that i noted uh were, were not on a scale um and they weren't they were not by the way average long term returns because the average long term return for the large cap growth and the large cap value 
would have been higher. Do you want to add anything to that, Christine? Sure. So in this research paper, which people can actually access if they're interested, it's called State of Retirement. I think you would type in Google something like State of, State of Retirement Income 2023, and you should be able to bring up a PDF of the white paper. Um, I don't think it's behind any sort of like gate where you would need to even enter your email address or anything like that. So you can see the um, whole research paper, but we do cite the return forecasts that we get from our colleagues in Morningstar Investment Management, and they come up with a 30-year forecast for us. And um, it's mainly a combination of a 10-year forecast, as well as a 20-year forecast bolted on, which is more or less, the 20-year the piece is more or less historical market returns from these asset classes. For the 10 years, that's a little bit more finely tuned because it takes into account where we are today with starting dividend yields, starting valuations, and so on. Um, and so the expectation is that U.S. market returns, especially in the large cap growth space, will be a little lower than historic norms, simply because valuations there today are much higher than they than they have been Um so that's the reason that that is lower than than market history that that ten year piece of the forecast for other asset classes it's um, you know just as high over the next ten years so their return expectation for non U S equities for Paul's favorite small cap value is just as high as I think the long term um, norm but they're haircut haircutting that large cap growth uh, space in particular. Question. We had a question around uh, guardrail strategies. And um, can you talk a little bit about how that differs from the bucket strategy? Yeah, so um, guardrails was a, a retirement spending strategy developed by Jonathan Guyton, who's a financial planner in Minneapolis. Incidentally, he's going to be coming to our Vogelheads conference in September uh, for people who are interested in hearing from John. Um, but he developed the strategy along with William Klinger, and it's a dynamic spending strategy. So it aims to um, help kind of reduce spending in bad market periods when the portfolio hasn't performed well, and also increase spending or you know give retirees permission to spend more when their portfolios have, have performed well. But the basic idea of the guardrails is that it's putting a limit on how much you can spend in a really good market environment and how little you can spend in a really bad market environment. So it doesn't want to, to throttle you down so much that your spending really reduces your quality of life. So that's the basic thesis behind guardrails. It gets a little bit complicated. John John Guyton pushes back a little bit when I say that, but it, it you know it's not necessarily a layperson strategy. You really need to, to read the fine print about it, but um, in terms of the strategy that delivers the highest starting safe withdrawal percentage, guardrails is, is the one of the ones that we tested that does that. And it also um, kind of maximizes lifetime spending by giving retirees permission to spend more um, in those good years. The downside, if there's a negative associated with guardrails, it's that there, it, because it does encourage consumption, it leaves you with fewer leftovers at the end of your life over many different market environments. It's it's encouraging you to spend, spend during your lifetime. And I just want to make a quick point on spending because I think sometimes people have this negative association with spending that, you know, if we're saying maximize consumption, spend more, we're saying buy a new car every year, go out to dinner every night or something, you know, frivolous like that. It's really, I think people need to think about spending more expansively to encompass lifetime giving, to see the fruits of your labors, you know, to make a difference for your loved ones during your lifetime. And that's one reason why, and, and Mike Piper wrote a whole book about this idea of, you know, to if, if you're someone who's in the position of having maybe more than you expect to need for your own lifetime, Try to think about ways that you can see that money work for you during uh, your lifetime versus passing it at the end of your life. Um, and Mike evangelizes about this. He's brought me on board with this. And I, you know, I often cite this gift that my parents gave my husband and me when we were just starting out our lives together. They gave us a nice chunk of money, not a huge sum, 
but a nice chunk of money to buy a better house than we were able to afford as our as our entry level house. And they got to see us, you know, a live nearby them in their community where we wanted to live anyway. And, uh, you know, just to see us not struggle quite as much as we would have the, with the fixer upper that we were able to afford with our own down payment. So it doesn't have to be big sums of money. This was a small sum relative to what we eventually inherited from my mom and dad, but it was something that I think gave them joy, gave us joy. And, uh, you know, just, uh, it's, it's just stuff to ponder, you know, helping kids pay down student loans or whatever, um, whatever you can do to try to lighten the load of the next generation. Jim, are you going to start that? I have watched my parents over save. Are you going to read that one? Um, that was one of the ones I flagged. So go ahead if you'd like to. I, I just think it's it. Forget the fact that it's about some big numbers, but th this person says I've watched my parents over save now sitting on millions and can't spend anything in retirement. How do I find a balance of saving the right amount and not be shortchanging my two days? Any books, resources to recommend? We have saved millions, have zero debt, fully paid for a house. How do I relax and not stress so much about the long term? I guess I guess we need Doc G here. But what yeah. would you say, Christine, to 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 that uh, that individual? Well, for one thing, I would say the struggle is real. And I have been um, spending a lot of time with this particular issue because, I mean, it seems like, um, you know, it's, it, seems, it seems like such a high class problem that people have more than they need. But people, we build our identities around this idea of I'm a saver. This is what I do. I'm a frugal person, you know, and it's very hard to flip that switch when you move into decumulation mode where you You've got to spend from what you what you've managed to save. I think people really do struggle with spending an appropriate amount. I can't tell you how many times I've been at a conference and someone, you know, will come up to me, a you know, gentleman in his mid, apparently in his mid 80s, who's telling me he's spending, well, I just spend two percent of my portfolio a year. And I'm thinking, gosh, why? Um, so a couple of ideas to help get over that hump one. And I know um, in some circles, annuities are a dirty word. Um, and I'm not talking about like the terrible variable annuities that are complicated and expensive, but like a very basic income annuity, I think can be kind of an elegant situation where it's kind of a one-time transaction where you're sinking X amount into the annuity and then it just pays you as a stream of income for the rest of your life. I think that's one idea. Um, it's something that I plan to ponder as I move into retirement. Um, and I have an example from someone who's used that successfully, Taylor Larimore, who is, um, I think sometimes called the Prince of the Bo Bogleheads. Um, he's been one of the lead Bogleheads. He's written a book called The Three Fund Portfolio, was in the Battle of the Bulge, turned 100 uh, this past February, just a real prince of a man. Um, Taylor, uh, has an annuity that he purchased, I don't know when he was 70 or something like that. And he gets these payouts and gives them to his kids and grandkids. That's how he uses the annuity. It's his lifetime gifting strategy, oh. which I think is a really cool use of a product like that, a, a really great way to give yourself permission to spend. And by the way, I will say, you know, the the life insurance company that struck that deal with Taylor, <laughs> they got a bad deal um, in that one. Um, and, yeah. and, and Taylor made out really well. But um, I, I like that idea. A financial, a financial advisor, I think, is another person who can help you spend appropriately. Dana Onspach um, is a financial advisor who I really love, who talks about, you know, how she works with her clients and she'll, she'll be like, you're spending this money. I'm going to send you a check, whether you like it or not, you're getting a check, do something with it. So for people who really need that d discipline, I think using an advisor can help as well. Um, but those are a couple of ideas. Could you, could you expand on that just a little bit? I think there are a couple of questions about, um, so what's a wealth advisor, what's a tax advisor, what's a wealth manager, what's a financial planner? 
Um, can you just kind of give a, a sense of what you what you would expect a wealth manager to do for a client? Yeah, and I will say the um, investment industry has not done itself any favors with this. all these terms. I think it's way, way too hard for people to find a financial planner. Um, there are all different variations. My bias is a little bit more toward financial planning, where someone is going to look holistically at your whole situation. They will do investment management, but it might not be the main thing that they do for you. Um, so I think about the hourly financial planner who my husband and I work with. They um, focus a lot on tax planning. They help us with decisions like, should we buy long-term care insurance? Um, you know, uh, when can we retire? Questions like that. That's what they do. Um, and I would say that my bias is there because I just feel like you get more bang for your buck um, versus paying that investment advisor. I think a lot of the investment portfolio management is something that people can kind of do with a little bit of know-how, whereas the other um, pieces of the puzzle, it seems like having access to that high-powered tax planning software, for example, that you get with the financial planner, that can be money well spent. So my bias is there um, for people who do want that ongoing investment management. You would probably want to look look to a, a registered investment advisor. I like the idea of looking for someone who is fee only. Um, so obviously they're not charging you commissions, someone who's a fiduciary. Um, again, my bias is more toward financial planning. So I would like to see those CFP letters after their name, a certified financial planner um, credential. I went through the program myself. It's not, not for Sunday drivers. You need to know about a lot of different aspects of financial planning to get the CFP credential. So I would look for those three things and, and also understand that there are a lot of different fee models. So um, this kind of the baseline model is where someone's charging you 1% of your assets year in and year out. I think that that, um, you know, maybe money well spent for some people, but for people who, who are comfy with the investment piece, you may be better off using kind of a different business model like the, the hourly model that I use or um, kind of a per engagement model where maybe someone would say, well, I'll give you a retirement preparedness review for, you know, X thousand dollars to go top to bottom on your plan. That might be the better sort of business model to explore if you're comfortable managing your portfolio on an ongoing basis. And I should also say there's been this proliferation of very cheap solutions for portfolio management. So Vanguard's portfolio advisory service, for example, has been raking in the clients um, because it's a very cheap uh, cheap solution for ongoing portfolio management. I think it's 30 or 35 basis points. So like point, I think it's either 0 0.30 or 0.35 per year for that ongoing portfolio management and, and rebalancing. And I think you also do get some contact with a human advisor. So there are um, some low cost options that are coming into the space that I think are really good for consumers. That's I got great. really lucky today, Christine. You know that I've struggled to find somebody who's a really great hourly advisor to take the time to understand all the things that we're teaching. And uh, I, I found a, a, a really great advisor who's going to come spend a day with me here and learn what we do and why we do what we do so that he can be an advisor and help those people on an hourly basis to do what what we advise. I mean, uh, if somebody wants to follow our advice, I'm not an advisor. Right. Uh, but I love that, Paul. And I will say another um, misconception that I think is is out there a little bit is that some somehow the hourly thing is for like people without a lot of assets or, you know, that the hourly advisors aren't especially sophisticated. I will say that the firm that my husband and I use is hyper sophisticated with respect to tax planning. In fact, they, um, they work with some CEOs here in Chicago because the CEOs can do math and say, well, listen, if I have this much in assets, I, 
am really averse to paying this ongoing toll in terms of a percentage of my portfolio. I'd rather just pay hourly. Um, so it's it's not necessarily for for less sophisticated investors or advisors and and not necessarily for people without a lot of assets. In fact, if you do the math and have a lot of assets, you might prefer to go hourly and um, you know not have that ongoing expense. Now, is it inappropriate for you to name the name of that firm? Probably. Okay. Um, I, I think it probably is. Uh, I, I don't don't probably want to do that in a public setting. I, I will probably second guess. I will guess what that firm is. And then those people who are read my newsletter will probably get the name of that firm in my newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. We need that. I will say they have a wait list. That's that's oh, one downside. See, that's they, the problem. That is they've exactly been growing like a weed. Yeah, it's 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 like John Luskin down in California in San Diego. I think, I think he's like eight months or ten months to be able to have a meeting with him as a new client. Mike Piper then, as well. Yes, I mean they, so these are that that leads me that leads me to at least my my final question of the night which is um so and Paul you talked a little bit about this when you you said um you were talking about the tax cost ratio and and looking at that so you know putting myself in the in the shoes of a novice advisor which is generous frankly for so for what I am but um where, what are the resources? And you mentioned some of these today, but if we could kind of recap on some of the websites that people could go to, to get some really helpful information, where would you recommend somebody get, you know, a primer on why tax cost ratio matters? And uh, some of these resources would be great to share with folks. Yeah, thanks for that question, Jim. So I have to say Morningstar.com is a great resource. Lots of free educational materials. All my articles and videos are there, all free not behind a paywall. Um, if you, at the line in the sand with Morningstar stuff is if you want any of the analyst reports on funds or individual stocks or exchange traded funds, that is behind the, the premium wall. One potential workaround there, um, as much as I think premium is, a, is worthwhile and worth spending money on, is public libraries are sometimes subscribers to a library service that we have. So if you want to just do kind of quickie due diligence on like holdings in a 401k plan, or if my advisor is recommending this, I want to do my homework on them, your public library may be a subscriber to that service, and they'd probably be very glad that you take advantage of it. So check that out. Paul mentioned bogleheads.org as a phenomenal resource for all kinds of questions. I mean, you can um, see people noodling about like the best coffee beans or the best luxury SUV, as well as all kinds of portfolio questions. So bogleheads.org is a wonderf wonderful resource. But the boglecenter.net is another website where we um, monitor our bogleheads coming and comings and going. So that's where you get alerts about our upcoming conference. Um, you get information about Bogleheads chapters. So there are Bogleheads chapters throughout the country, people who meet um, in certain geographies. I believe there's one in Seattle. Um, and there are also Bogleheads chapters organized by Life Stage. So there's a group of um, Bogleheads who are talking about all things retirement planning, for example. So um, that's another great resource. So that's kind of a short list. Paul, am I missing anything? Well, um, AAII, yeah. American Association of Individual Investors, AAII.com. Uh, you can subscribe for a month for a, a, a buck or two. A, a lot of information. Uh, also at paulmerriman.com, there's a list of truth tellers. And these are the people. It just so happens that Christine Benz is on our list. And uh, somebody she's worked with for probably 30 years, John Reckenthaler, somebody else. I mean, there are lots of people at Morningstar that I respect, but these two are, are I just think, are, are fantastic. And, uh, uh, and, and so we're trying our best to introduce people to, on our website to folks that we trust are giving the, the best information. In my case, it's mostly for do-it-yourself investors. And 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 basically, I think that's true with you too. Is that not true, Christine? That 
that's the base of your business or is the are advisors an important part of of your they business? are so morningstar.com is mainly for individual investors but we have a lot of software products that are geared toward advisors as well as financial institutions yeah. um so we are serving a variety of different audiences but morningstar.com is our main portal for individual investors and before i forget next week stan the annuity man now i know that a lot of people say no annuities in my life. I don't want any insurance person calling on me. I will tell you, this is the most knowledgeable person I have ever met on annuities and willing to educate people endlessly and a lot of fun, by the way. He's kind of in my, he'll be in our face. He's he's not, he's not a, a gentle soul. He's a wonderful, <laughs> active guy who wants to help folks I've never met anybody like him. I hope you'll come back next week. And Christine, thank you so much. I really just appreciate what you do. Folks don't realize how many organizations you talk to uh, over the years. And and you don't have to. It's not in, it's not something that Morningstar makes you do. I know I know that. And so we appreciate it. And I appreciate the fact that you are the president of the Bogleheads organization or the foundation. And, and, and that is so imp such important work. And Jim, thank you for all that you do to help us get this information into the hands of people. I'm sorry we didn't answer all the, the questions. I will look them over and I will try to answer some uh, on my site uh, if people are interested. And I'll share some with you, Christine, if, if you have a way that that you respond to folks, although they are not leaving their email addresses. So we can't get back to them that way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. And thanks, Jim, as well. I appreciate you all being here. Paul, I just have to say you are such a role model to me in terms of just, you know, modeling out what I want to evolve into. I mean, you just continue to uh, live with right. such purpose and really, um, our, our role model of like what, what we can do with our human capital. Thank you very much. You're very nice. All right. Awesome. Thank you all, by the way. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next week. And this will be up on the website at BCF, Bainbridge Community Foundation, within a week, probably, Jim. Yep. That's and right. We'll have it up on our site. And we're going to do, we want to get this into the hands of as many people as we can. So please help us. Thank you. See you next you. week. Thank you all. Night, Christine. Good night. Thanks, Jim.